Um, my name is Richard Evans. Um, Tony Malia. Uh, I, Tony and I met just yesterday. We realized that we had an awful lot uh, in common in terms of what our interests were for being at this conference. Um, and uh, so when Ginger approached us and said that she had some uh, a slot to fill, um, we leapt at the opportunity to talk about a couple of things that are close to our hearts. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of presentation jazz here, uh, and we, we don't know how the timing is going to work out, so um, I'll drive and, uh, and, and Tony will help keep me honest. Um, so the, what is the time? Are we a half an hour? Okay. Uh, this is count down there. Okay, so what we'd like to talk to you about today is um, security, um, specifically enterprise semantic media wiki uh, and the Internet of Things, uh, which is a term that I haven't heard thrown around here yet. Um, and uh, specifically, we would like to talk about the necessity of security and how that uh, relates to overall system modeling. Uh, this is basically the outline. Uh, again, we put these charts together a little bit earlier today. Uh, so we're going to try to run through this fast and get to the end where we can open up uh, for what we hope are the, are con are, is the good questions and conversation. Um, what I really wanted to do was start out by showing uh, this chart that I shamelessly stole from the World Wide Web uh, Consortium. You can find this easily on the web. This is, uh, this is created by the folks that are, uh, that are currently setting all of the standards. Uh, and you can see, in, if you can read the small green, uh, you know, in the PC era, they're dating that at around 1977. Uh, and in the top right where you see Web 4.0, it's calling it out at, at, at you know, present day. The, there are two axes on this chart, and the, uh, the horizontal x-axis is the connections between people, um, which you can think of uh, the Brian's talk just prior to ours would be a, a good... Um, uh, a good way to relate that axis, uh, the importance of, of, uh, of information being relatable to authors and consumers and developers. Uh, and then the vertical axis is the connections between information, which you can easily see that in large organizations, information has to flow uh, from, from policy creators, subject matter experts, and so forth. Um, and so then the, the graph itself is a, is a way that you can locate technologies as they emerged. And, uh, and so as you can see, you know, the wikis, uh, I don't think my, I was hoping to have a pointer here. Hold on, let me see if I can. Can I? It's in demand. No, I think I just got my laser pointer. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Okay. So you can see the wikis kind of land here. Um, and then you have semantic search and um, and ultimately like the semantic, the semantic web. And where is all of this going? So the, the important point that I want to draw attention to is uh, this is the future. And so for a lot of us in our organizations and we're sort of suffering, you know, a lot of what we live with day to day is still spreadsheets and email and, uh, and file servers. Uh, at an enterprise level, what we're trying to advocate is, is that um, corporations, companies can move up this, up this line, uh, and where, what does it really get to? Get to? Um, as you move further up this graph, uh, there is an increasing need for operating in larger environments with, uh, with security needs at multiple levels. And so when you're working way down low on the chart, uh, you can kind of handle security from a sort of simple file system you know, conventions, but as you go further up to the Web 4.0, Web 3.0, uh, we really need to have these multi-layered security mechanisms that allow data to move through the organization um, properly. Uh, just real briefly, what I wanted to do, this was very helpful to me. Um, you know, the, the original web was when we were able to put documents online, uh, embed links, and, and real quickly go from one document to another just by clicks. Uh, web 2.0 was the realization that, hey, we could pay attention to who's visiting the websites, and we could tailor the content based on, you know, who they are. Web 3.0, or the semantic web, 
um, is, when, is when the data is actually linked inside the documents. And so no, no longer do we imagine these, uh, these maps of the internet as, uh, as the documents online being the nodes and the, and the links inside connecting everything. We're actually um, attributing meaning to those links, and so we know why the documents are linking. And, uh, and so the links literally point to each other. They point from data to other data. And in the same way that Web 1.0 allowed you to not care about the server, uh, the underlying server architecture, you were just skipping from web page to web page, not really worrying too much about what the underlying server platform was. In the Web 3.0 world, we can go from data to data and not worry too much about what document it's living in. And ultimately, uh, that what that opens up is the Web 4.0, the intelligent web, where once you have everything semantically encoded, then you can begin to put together very sophisticated um, uh, AI and intelligent agents that can do a lot of the grunt work and heavy lifting of putting together weekly, monthly, yearly reports, um, doing the analytics, and a lot of great, uh, a lot of great data science emerges from that. Um, I threw this chart in real rapidly because uh, during the lunch break I realized that um, not everyone here is, on, is fully knowledgeable about the semantic media wiki distinction between a regular wiki and a semantic wiki. Um, and so uh, I thought this, these were some words that I put together from an email that I sent to a colleague a while back. Uh, what is a wiki? Everybody asks that. We use this term, we encourage people to use them. Um, and I thought it was really, you know, good to go back to the, the beginning. Um, and uh, I'm not super knowledgeable about the, the, the history, but I got a quote, right? Uh, Ward Cunningham, the simplest online database that could possibly work. Uh, cutting through all of the complexities of a, of a formal database front end, just put the database on the web and let people edit the data. Uh, the simplest online database that could possibly work. And then the semantic web, um, is doing what I said previously, which is allowing the data to interrelate. Data that is encoded in a page can then be harvested, mined, uh, and, and aggregated into other pages. So that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, so then we switch over to what is the Internet of Things. Um, and simplifying to the extreme, we start in the, in the lower left and we're basically building devices that we can talk to. We're connecting them on our desktops. We're connecting our phones to our laptops. We're connecting our uh, televisions to our home internets. Um, and then once we graduate beyond that, we're connecting things out into the World Wide Web at large and things are getting unmanageable at that level. And uh, the semantic web of things is where uh, machines are actually able to make sense of all the interconnected devices that are out there. Uh, this is particularly important to the, uh, to the enterprise world. Uh, the blue line represents the human population, world population, and the green line represents the number of devices that are, uh, that are being applied to the, to, the, to the World Wide Web. And currently what we're seeing is on average about six devices per person is the Internet of Things. And very quickly, we're going to go well beyond the world population in terms of uh, devices on the net. So if we take a step back, and this is just represents you know, 30 seconds of my brainstorming of you know, where are the user bases, right? We've got governments and private industry. There's uh, service providers, customers, people selling things, people buying things. Um, we have you know, product communities that emerge, gaming communities that emerge, um, any, any, uh, any product line or, or, or industry uh, will have a community of practitioners or people that are intensely interested in that topic and you'll get those communities. Uh, and then you also have the whole uh, web experience of personal expression and everybody wants to share with the people that they care about. Um, Similarly, right, if we look at data applications out there, we've got law, regulatory, policy, I won't do the list, but what I want to start getting to um, in, at the end of the first half of this talk is uh, all of this, right, involves increasing multiple layers of security. 
And so sensitive but unclassified is a term that, that, that I still use a lot, SBU. There's just general proprietary data. Uh, if you have access to somebody's um, um, invention blueprints and you're hosting that, uh, you have to manage that properly and so forth. We all, um, Tony will talk, uh, is an expert on the controlled and un but unclassified information. And, uh, and then even at the, you know, in, in, in industry, right, we have to worry about data, data being uh, exposed to other countries that it's, that it's not supposed to be shared, shared with, and that's the, uh, that's the ITAR. Um, ultimately, when you think of life cycle management for data, um, most data, uh, we have a term called data at rest or DAR, and so you can imagine all this information being generated every day in the world ultimately becomes data at rest. Um, but at the same time, there's also data that's not yet a historical fact, and you have things that are, you know, we have a, um, uh, an, a calendar of events, things that we hope to have happen, so we have all this data that's not quite um, reached the, the, the data at rest point of its life cycle. And then we also have to worry about what is the retention schedule, right? There's, there's all this information accumulating and at what point does it need to be reviewed and discarded? So, okay, so now we get to the heart of it. Um, security and access control, uh, Tony and I realized that this is, this is the heart of the interface between uh, the way MediaWiki is today and what we want it to be tomorrow. Uh, access control is everything. Um, the, there are services, uh, I should have put infrastructure at the top, so every, every network uh, begins with a foundation of infrastructure, then there's some basic network services that go on top of that, and then there's applications on top of the services. And every one of them, at every level, needs to worry about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And I'm simplifying this uh, to say that confidentiality and availability is who, when, and why, for access control, and integrity is how do we enforce, how do we implement uh, the, the who, the when, and the why, it's the how. So fortunately, um, there is, uh, our, our government uh, has implemented a, an entire uh, branch of the government for informing us of official things like how long is, uh, how long is a meter, uh, what is a second, um, so the National Institutes of Standards and Technology uh, has been given the responsibility of coming up with security guidance uh, and setting the standards for all government information systems. Um, certainly, the, the, the public is not required to follow these things, but any, any information system in the government does. Uh, and there are three basic documents to this. FIPS 199 gives you the, the high-level categorizations. It, uh, 200 gives you the areas of concern that you can't, uh, minimum areas of concern, and 800-53 goes into extensive detail on how you can address these issues, guidance and specific controls. Uh, just as a simple example, um, this is a, a chart that I put together for a security uh, presentation a while back. Uh, on the left, you have the front cover of FIPS 199, and on the right, you see the rel most relevant section for what we're talking about. You see confidentiality, integrity, and availability defined, and you have these three categories, low, moderate, and high, which represents the way that they uh, classify these, these, different, these three different, um, three different uh, dimensions of, of uh, IT security. So that's FIPS 199. And then FIPS 200 says that for each of these dimensions, there are 17 categories that must be addressed. And, um, and specifically, when I put these charts together, we were having a discussion about whether or not we needed to have network cables in uh, covered cable trays. Uh, so we're going to run you know, from one information system to another somewhere else, and can we just throw cables, commingle cables in with other cables, or do we have to have a protected distribution system, as they say? So that falls under the physical, um, physical and environmental protection for security, and, uh, and that's just one example. Um, again, we're focusing on access control, which is there are 25 specific control sets that are associated with access control, and you can find this document very easily online. Um, and then for each one of those, 
you visit 800-53 and it goes into endless detail about how you can look up um, whether it's low, moderate, or high and how many of the different controls apply for your system. So stepping back for a second, if you're, if you're in the government and you're trying to bring a new information system online, the first thing you have to do is classify it as low, moderate, or high, and then you have to come up with a security plan that addresses um, literally hundreds upon hundreds of security controls. And that's one of the big barriers that all, I think, enterprise or corporations have in onboarding uh, some major new way of doing information uh, management or knowledge capture. And so the next part that we want to talk about um, is, and I'm, I might have these out of order, so maybe uh, if we get to the question area we can come back. Um, I wanted to say, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, why we would want to push for enterprise semantic media wiki in our organizations. Uh, and I just jotted down a couple of, um, I mean, at some level this is the one chart that I, I think um, if you're here, right, you have a grasp of why this is valuable. Uh, the ability to model corporate data, the ability to um, capture data. Um, so this is, uh, and, and ultimately it's the semantic triple that makes, uh, that breaks the relationship of the traditional corporate ontology, trying to create a Newtonian hierarchy that uh, perfectly explains in a consistent way how every bit of corporate data can fall into its proper place. In reality, um, there are incompatible ontologies and the semantic triple model and the semantic uh, web allows for incompatible ontologies to commingle together and, and the relationships between them are what you work with. So that's why we're so excited about this. Um, let me. I also wanted to spend one moment here and connect it back with the Internet of Things. So if you think about all the devices, um, one of the most one of the one of the earliest um, realizations that we want people to have with uh, the Semantic Media Wiki is is this idea of the semantic triple and that the user is the first object known to the known to the database and everything can then be in relation to the user but when we get into an internet of things we're also going to have a page for every device that the that the site would have any access or knowledge of and so we can build this relationship between subject object and predicate where even the predicates which is um, has has title um, as a predicate would, would be something that you could analyze and talk about as an object. The, the concept of has title is an object in this, in this paradigm. Okay, so the challenges are, at, uh, and this is again just a, a real quick um, um, brainstorming of what the, thought, of what, of what the, uh, the challenges would be, is that the, the users, um, that you know, those of us that are the technologists, the ontologists, um, and the people that we want using these systems, if we can have them implemented, uh, they are not the CIOs, and they don't have any responsibility that the CIO has, the chief information officer. Um, and so the chief information officer is the person who would be in trouble if your organization leaked data that it was not supposed to leak. And so first you need a business rationale, and then you have to be able to convince the chief information officer that this application um, will address the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of the data at the levels for which it's been classified. Um, ultimately, enterprise CIOs, they want to purchase the infrastructure services and applications to meet their security plan. They don't want to have to create a, a security plan for a new piece of technology. Um, CIOs are responsible for ensuring that the applications have training available to the enterprise users. And so if you do select uh, a new software platform and you roll it out, you've got an entire enterprise of employees that are going to be wondering what they're supposed to do with it. So then there's the training piece and the idea that people would just gravitate towards it and figure it out is, um, um, is not realistic. Uh, these are the main reasons why the chief information officer of an enterprise uh, large or a large organization would, would today be hesitant to choose MediaWiki, and we're hoping to work with you guys and change that. <clears throat> 
So, you know, this is an intentionally left blank uh, section of the presentation, right? I just want everyone to sort of ponder, uh, do we want Enterprise MediaWiki, do we want Semantic MediaWiki to be the de facto standard for the secure web 4.0 semantic web of things? Uh, I do, right? So that's, that's where we're advocating um, that something as it is today, we have to, we have to address the topic of access control. Um, what we're ultimately trying to encourage is that the MediaWiki community at whatever level, whether it's the uh, Wikimedia Foundation or whether it's this group of, uh, of programmers and developers, um, we'd, we'd, like to, we'd like to change the official stance from if, if it's a CMS that you need, you might want to think of a different application. We would love to hear the phrase, if you need access control, here's what you do. Um, we would love for this community to endorse a short set of extensions that, when configured properly, uh, provide access controls that meet the NIST uh, access control, control sets. Uh, we would like this community to value the impact to security as much as they do, or my own personal observation, um, localization for extensions. Is, uh, I actually tried to make an extension um, about nine years ago and uh, failed miserably to localize it properly, and that was all I heard from the community. Um, and so I, localization is important. It's what, it's what allows um, internationality, um, if I'm saying that right. And so it is important that uh, extensions have, have the ability to support internationality, um, but it's also important, it's a value uh, that, that I would hope that the community would support uh, that, that security, uh, security implications of extensions are monitored and paid attention to. Um, and maybe they are, right? And so I'm not the person to, uh, to assess that. Uh, and then lastly, we would love uh, for this community to provide any enterprise chief information officer with a security model that they can implement. Uh, showcase a moderate, an installation of MediaWiki that meets the, the, the moderate classification of the NIST document. And I think you would see enterprise adoption um, surge. A uh, couple of concluding remarks. Um, these are just my own thoughts. Um, so at present, a MediaWiki site running with or without third-party extensions can only be used as a NIST moderate information system as long as it is fully contained within a portal. And that's tragic because, you, yes, you can deploy an, enter, an enterprise MediaWiki, um, but you wrap it in a portal and don't let it to talk to anything else. And so if I run back, to one of the earliest charts. We have a technology that can operate up here. And because we can't do access control, it's forced to live in a box down here. OK. Thank you. Um, I uh, just add something? Just go back to your last, your last slides. OK. Uh, the one, yeah, the, the NIST moderate um, is the baseline for all the CUI enforcement that's going to happen. Uh, student records are CUI. I don't know if you understand. All medical records are CUI. Sorry, you. Sorry, what's CUI? Uh, it, it's, it's controlled unclassified information. There are a hundred categories of this. Even, even information about historic properties in, in the National Park Service, it's, it's, got a, it's got a CUI label to it, yeah. There are all sorts of things that, that are going to kick in the requirement, the baseline requirement, which is moderate. Nothing's going to, so if you're going to store any of this stuff, you're going to start with moderate, and then the, 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 the more exciting stuff uh, uh, go, goes up and requires higher, but at the moment you've got some of this, some of this information in a federal agency, or 
in a contractor who's dealing with, uh, dealing with the federal government, and they, they carry it. There's another one, a 177, I think, uh, which, 171, which is the guidance to the, to the, to the uh, uh, government contractors as to how they've got to behave with, this, uh, with the, 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 the CUI information. So this is going to kick in, and we're going to suddenly see, wait a minute, you have to assess every system to find out what, what it's got on it, and, and if it's got CUI, you have to implement these controls. And that was the survey mechanism that I was talking about earlier, which is the gathering process to find out how, what's going to be on a system and therefore what controls you've got to put on. And so we, we, we feel that as this gets escalated and enforcement is just kicking in right now, uh, this next year, I think, is the year that, that compliance is required in the federal government. And so you're going to see this kicking in, and so you're going to see the use of all these types of systems saying, you better have the controls in place. Well said. Um, so that is our presentation. Um, we have about five minutes left of our allotted time. Uh, questions? Thank you. Is it working yet? Thank you very much for that. Um, certainly from my perspective, I 100% agree that um, there is absolutely a user case for, for the requirement to split up data, and especially as well with GDPR coming in in Europe. Again, exactly the same thing. Is, are we in a similar situation in terms of uh, the internet was always designed to be open and it's, it's so much more difficult now to retrospectively secure? Is that the same with MediaWiki? Are we are we fundamentally breaking how it is designed, or is this a relatively simple um, fix? Um, so I don't know the answer to whether it's a relatively simple fix or not. Um, I am not the MediaWiki expert. Oh, so, oh, okay, go ahead, Brian. Hi, um, so I'm a MediaWiki developer. In terms, so for most ACL type stuff in MediaWiki, it's n not that bad, but in terms of read restrictions, there's a lot of places that make simplifying assumptions that either like everyone can read or if there's some restrictions of reads, it's split into a binary group of, okay, this group can do nothing and this group can do everything. Once you start getting into very limited read things where people can read and also have access to all the special pages and the API, there's quite a few things that need to change in MediaWiki to make that happen safely. Uh, you, just a comment. What you're going to find is if you've got a mixture of these, of these markings on, on your wiki, you're going to make a decision based on the marking of the content. It's not an overall decision. So if this content is marked at a certain level, then there are certain controls that are required to do it, and you, 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 you know, so, so we're going to have to get to fine-grained access on attribute-based control uh, on, the, on the content. Yeah. Yeah. And like, if it was in terms of, are you allowed to edit this page, like, that could be done in MediaWiki, not that hard. But right. in terms of, can you view this page, it's and not just, can you directly view this page, yeah. there's no hacky backdoor way of getting right. what is on this page. Um, at the moment, that's not really, like, in terms of our parser, um, like, it assumes that the current user can view all the templates so and everything. I, I, like, there's a lot of simplifying assumptions there that would need to be changed. Yeah. yeah. If you're talking about storing mixed classifications on a single system, I don't believe that you can get there. And the reason I don't believe you can get there is because you have data at rest requirements You've got, and then there's, there's all sorts of special pages. If somebody can get into the images folder, for example. Right, so there's right, the. And then uh, you've, got, you've got portion marking requirements. Yeah. Uh, you're, I think you're really opening Pandora's box in terms of what I believe you're trying to say. Um, we've gone a different route, and it's actually just a matter of implementing wikis. Uh, say that as again? As a whole, implementing wikis as a whole. Okay. Um, rather than trying to get to share like the, the NASA model of trying to reduce, we've actually gone the other way. Um, 
I, I believe it's the only way that you can actually meet the requirements for for like encrypting data at rest, for example, um, access control issues. Uh, you get into need to know requirements, stuff like that, and you open a hell of a lot more worms than than you, than, than you initially think of. Because so we went, we went right. down that same road. Um, nonetheless, um, what, how, what's the what's the famous Galileo uh, Latin quote? And yet it moves. <laughs> um, so the the previous um, talk spoke about the relationship age, and um, in lieu of MediaWiki. Uh, making itself capable of operating at this level, there will be uh, for-profit solution providers and they will own the day. So it really comes down to a choice. I, I, I believe that the, the technical solution to this probably lies somewhere in the OAuth 2 area. Uh, in other words, of scope definitions, token issues by the by the an authorization server, uh, and 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 some of that piece built in to the foundation of MediaWiki. Um, I just want to say I don't think anyone objects to making MediaWiki be useful this purpose, but like in terms of most developers, this would be very like low down on right. things they care like. No one at the Wikimedia Foundation is going to work on this. Um, but I, I suspect nobody in principle objects. Like there's some vague political statements about, oh, this is not how wikis work. Sure. Wikis are, everyone can edit and do everything, right? Yeah. But there's no objection to making MediaWiki be able to do this thing. It's a little complicated because it digs yeah. deep into how MediaWiki works. Yeah. But like if someone wanted to go do it, I can't imagine people would object to merging the patches. True. Well, I'm I'm no expert in all of these regulations and but um, you know, at the same time that it seems like overkill to me and I th I'm thinking literally of my uh, my son's high school information system that is so terribly bad and you can't get any information out of it it must be compliant with all these regulations it's very secure uh, <laughs> with an air gap right <laughs> um, yeah. but I do know a little bit about network technology and MPLS networks and tagging you know like individual packets and stuff and and, and scalability goes to hell but if you can actually like tag content with like a user ID and their authorization level and kind of filter stuff out like that, maybe that's like some kind of yeah. technical solution. Well, what about return queries with the API? Like let's just try to do infrastructure. But why no properties are are accessible to to certain individuals? If you get somebody like him in, I guarantee you he's gonna find a way to pull a property that he's not supposed to have access to. Like it's just it's it's a problem. The government has Yeah. It's a problem across the board. And that's why yeah. you have control lists that will yeah. fill up a three ring binder that's four inches thick, no problem. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a fundamental issue, and I believe it's actually, it's actually contrary to what the wikis were designed to do. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, I, I'm, yeah, I don't have a solution. Oh. I'm just trying to think like. Well, well crazy. and if I may, if I may interrupt, um, contrary to what the wiki was designed to do, um, In the sense that the wiki is designed to be as open as possible and the emphasis on being able to perform access control has never been a configuration, that, that capability has never been designed into the requirements for, for MediaWiki. Um, there are ways to do it. And so the message that I have is, is that I'm, I'm actually not even advocating a change in MediaWiki. What I'm advocating for is um, is there an example of how MediaWiki as an application is implemented with all of the underlying uh, services and infrastructure such that when an enterprise chief information officer is doing a trade study uh, between different packages that they might select, we would love to see MediaWiki on the board with 
the contingencies that you're doing these other things outside of MediaWiki. So, for, you know, forgive me if I've given the message that I want MediaWiki to be uh, a, a, a complete solution. What I'm saying is, is that the community, I think, especially this enterprise MediaWiki community, should present some kind of finished product uh, where the application is living in, in, a, uh, in an overall design package that includes, uh, that includes the server configuration and includes maybe some other things. And I think that's what the, what the enterprise, what the corporate CIO doesn't want to do is take on an IT design project. And if this community could provide that design project that includes MediaWiki in its present state, I'm saying that would be a home run. Well, um, well, uh, uh, as far as read control, it seems to me that the elephant in the room, so to speak, is Semantic MediaWiki itself, which doesn't have any read uh, control. And that's 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 not really something. And semantic media cargo cargo has the same problem. I, I think it would it would require fundamental restructuring of the storage to enable that, which it just seems like a complete non-starter yeah. to me. So the, I, I don't know if you have have thought about that at all. Well, um, I, I haven't. Um, again, where where we're at and where I think my my NASA colleagues are is we we've we've got these things working securely in a portal environment. Is that a, a fair thing to say that, you know, we, we create the portal, we install MediaWiki in the portal? As a whole, yes. yes, you're in or you're out. Yes, you're in or you're out. Right. And, uh, and, and sadly, right, that then when you apply the need to know principle um, cuts a lot of people out. <laughs> yes, uh, so we have a hint. I was just going to add that I, I think in our experience, the statement of what you just said of the need to know principle, it ends up cutting a lot of people out. I would actually say it, it ends up challenging management and administrators to reassess what that means and that they actually needed to be including people who originally were being excluded right. um, by that old system um, of multiple individual document level permissions. Yeah. You're very right. Uh, it's absolutely uh, need to know is an organizationally interpreted statement. Yeah, in the security world, it's least privilege. That's the, that's the way it's expressed. And basically, and, and it's fuzzy. And, that, and that's the problem. Yeah, it's just attacking the problem from the other side of forcing a reassessment because it's more open to Cindy. Uh, just want to say, first of all, there's a question. Um, from the YouTube audience. Um, and um, I think it's been answered already, but would love to hear Cindy's, um, which is why I'm reading this, or generally <laughs> Wikimedia Foundation's comments on the security topic. And I think Brian did a good job of, a uh, very good job of, you know, covering that. Um, and just wanted to give my um, two cents, especially since I got named specifically. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, I agree that you know our solution to this problem for our government customers in the past has always been the portal-based solution, a single wiki per, or, you know, the wiki was the um, element of control. And it's, it, yeah, it wasn't designed to, to have a lower level of granularity for access control. And if you really want to be secure, um, so I'm, I, th as Brian said, I don't think anybody is averse to um, having, a, you know, more secure solution oh, yeah. with with the understanding that the base media wiki, of course, needs to scale to Wikipedia scale. Right. And so nothing could, you know, and a lot of these security solutions would Im include a a lot of sure cost in in yeah. performance. And so, um, but having a configuration, and, and there are multiple configurations with the wiki as the container, sure. or the, the, the element of, of security that have been certified to be acceptable for government use. 
And, you know, a containerized approach pre-configured with yeah. um, extensions that um, is, you know, pen tested and secure mm -hmm. that could be a starting point for folks, you know, is something the third party community could come together and right. develop. Um, since I have Brian here, I just wanted to, I had an idea about how content the content handler could uh, be abused to uh, stop transclusion and that sort of thing, which I think is the, typically the largest hole people have for access control. Um, and that, that was just an idea that I had on the technical level of how to address uh, the access when you're talking about the container being the page. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you could do a lot of things with Content Handler, but it mostly comes down to you're either using the wiki text built in parser or you're writing your own. Um, so I don't really know if that would fix the transclusion problem because you either have to fix it in the general parser and then you're back to where you start, which is actually something I kind of think we should do for other reasons, or you're writing your own parser, and in which case that's a big effort. Um, but I think that I think the parser has ways that the content, you can tell, the, the content can tell the parser not to transclude, or at least, I, I no. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 that's what I'm talking about, so, and it's probably not, it may, it may get us from the PC era up to web 2.0, but, yeah. Um, so yeah, the content handler can specify how transclusions work, but if I remember correctly, which I may not be. I don't believe like state was included in that decision, so it wasn't something you could do like per user. Um, more generally though, like on this topic, keep in mind like things change. Um, I'm just thinking about like originally, I don't believe blocking users was part of MediaWiki. Like back in the day, this was before my time, so I may have this wrong. If someone was vandalizing articles, you had to get someone to go in with like shell access to like ban them. So like, you know, now we have blocking people. Now we have a lot of complex permissions as they became necessary for Wikipedia as it grew. So there's no rule that MediaWiki can't change, right? So uh, I think when you get into discussions about uh, fine grain access control and when you also discuss the different layers of data protection that can be applied, it's important to think back to the origins of this. You know, think back to the 1950s when you just had different stacks of documents and one set of papers might have been tagged as some level, another stack of papers might have been tagged slightly less protected, and then these two pages here are completely free to read. But it was, they were, they were stamped as whole, right? And so the reason that we at NASA have gone with the whole wiki approach is that we consider a wiki a document, a set of 1,050 pages or whatever. So it sort of simplifies it for us. But if you want to go down the road of trying to split up access within a wiki, it becomes really challenging because what is actually protected? If you have this object, this thing, like this laptop or whatever, or some GPS antenna, the fact that it's the color gray is not protected. The fact that it has, uh, you know, that it's uh, 12 inches long is not protected. But the details of how the code is written to determine exactly where the space station is at that moment or uh, the, the chemistry behind how this uh, component works is protected. And so how do you break it down to every little itty bitty property that's within a wiki and somehow control all that? I mean, that's why to me it just blows my mind so that you could ever get a solution for that. Uh, I, I think the granularity, if we look at the, at the regulations of, of, of what's coming through here, it's kind of at the, at the document level, uh, and it's thought of, uh, for, it, it covers paper as well as electronic. So it, it's, it's probable that the markings have to be done at the page level. Uh, 
and that and it's saying whether it links to something else that's at a different marking or not, I, I don't know. But that's probably the granularity based on the on the what we're seeing on the regulations coming through. That the marking actually has to be electronically in the in the uh, in the page. Um. I'd like to add also, when you start to get granularity, sometimes you can combine data in ways that is surprising. Like this is the usual example with like the census. If you take a census, maybe how many people of this religion are in this area? Maybe that's not sensitive. And how many people live in this neighborhood? Maybe that's not sensitive. And how many people have red hair? Maybe that's not sensitive. And how many people are over 30? That's not sensitive. How many people are over 30 of this specific religion with red hair? Maybe that is sensitive because now you know that only your neighbor is over 30 with red hair and now you know her secret religion that's like persecuted. Um, I, I like, it, you know, what I mean by like combining data can, can lead to things that don't seem sensitive at first, but really are. I, I think at the highest level, this is a, a challenge of the age we live in. And, um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm only trying to say that this problem will be solved. And um, there's an opportunity. Um, sorry, um, it's funny that this comes up now because it's something that I was uh, talking to a Google colleague of mine, have you heard of homomorphic encryption? I have not. So homomorphic encryption is, it allows you to have two encrypted numbers and perform operations on it and then get an re encrypted result uh, and that result is correct. Although the machine performing the operation does not know what it is actually working with. So two plus two equals four uh, but the machine doesn't know that it was handling two and two. It was just, you know, adding something. So our idea, or my, it's pretty wild. Um, you encrypt, you give um, private keys to each user and encrypt every single object in the information base with each potential user's private key. And then, for example, the search engine will you have to log into the search engine and it will have your public key to decrypt and it will do homomorphic operations and have results and then check whether you are entitled to decrypt these results and only then show it to you i we have no idea whether that is practical but it would put um the encryption and the access control on the individual app um, uh, object. And I was remembered, reminded for this when um, I think it was you, Greg, who mentioned, you know, tagging packages and we're packets, yeah, packets. But, it, and you know, this Google guy, he knows a lot more about systems engineering than I do, but he says it sounds very complicated, but it maybe we could give it a try. But there's a Wikipedia article on homomorphic encryption and you, you want to have a look at that. Thank you, I will. So uh, just a, a comment to the organizer that we are uh, well into the red. Um, I just want to mention homomorphic encryption is very, very cool, but it's also very, very inefficient. Like it's an active area of research, of course, but like you're talking like 20 minutes to add two numbers together. Well, I don't know, I don't follow it that closely, but like, it's not anywhere near like efficient enough, except for in very special cases. Uh, I, I, the first law will make it practical in five years. <laughs> Maybe. Now, what we need is a solution that meets the criteria and the controls. And, and the simplest and the quickest, the better. <laughs> that meets the control. So we're not really in, in, in we, we, we can't modify the controls as defined by NIST, so we've just got to meet the, the, the requirement. Well, um, so I, we didn't want to, uh, to have to end on anything that wasn't a positive. Um, again, there are lots of media wikis um, that are being deployed in enterprise environments where the people who've done it 
have done all the hard work of uh, meeting the you know the site security plan. And so um, I'll I'll leave or I'll end with uh, maybe just rephrasing my main hope, and that is is that this community can provide a template for how everyone could do that without having to make it a homework assignment for themselves. Okay, thank you very much. Oh.